the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. It is now Easter. Alleluia! Christ is risen. are finally here and it's been a journey to get here and as I was preparing for this evening I came across some numbers that uh, stood out to me they um, they were from a 2012 uh, survey and they indicated that 77 percent believe what we celebrate today to be true that in the United States that Christ rose from the dead they said 86% of Americans believe in the person of Jesus. And this is what surprised me. From two years later, uh, Barna surveying the same article said only 42% connect that truth with this day. That only 42% connect the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with Easter tells me there's a whole lot of Cliff Notes versions of the gospel being uh, digested. That a lot of us believe or understand the story up here a little bit like I know that there's some piece in Huck Finn of Tom Sawyer uh, uh, tricking kids into whitewashing the fence, but it doesn't change my life. It stays right here in something I read years and years and years ago. We know this story. I asked last week, uh, how, if this was our core identity as Christians, we could let this week go without paying it due attention. I compared it to being a UVA basketball fan, and there's no way that I would miss one of the final four or 16 or even the, uh, the final 64 games. Uh, but as a Christian, this being the week of weeks, how could we not dig in more deeply? And part of it, I think, is because I didn't know, uh, actually, until the last buzzer uh, sounded whether Virginia was going to win. I know this story. But in some ways, I know it up here. In some ways, I know it here. And then sometimes it trickles into here. And then sometimes it trickles into my hands and feet and the person that I am in the world. I need it to live not just on this night, here and here and here, but every day. And that's why I come. And that's why I walk through each of these days to get to this moment. And this day invites us to go deeper into the story, to start off in the darkness, the black of that empty tomb. It invites us to wonder and to even go more deeply than the details were given in the story. You know, there's no account of Jesus' actual resurrection. What was it like in the dark tomb? What was it like for the Son of God whose parting thought was, Why have you forsaken me? Daddy, Daddy, why have you forsaken me? What was it like to wake up, to come back to life, to realize that you weren't forgotten, that you weren't expendable, that you weren't just part of some master negotiation? What was it like for Jesus? And then, as we still are in the darkness, what was it like as dawn was getting ready to break? And people in that kind of despondency that we might have been in once or twice in our life, hopefully not many more times than that, of, of being unable to sleep and not sure what to do with ourselves because we just don't know how to respond. And we're anxious and we're, we're twiddling and we think, all right, well, maybe just because I need to do something, I can go as Sabbath is ending and be there. And maybe I can get somebody to move that giant rock and just maybe we'll be able to properly prepare our beloved friend, our son, for a proper burial. It's at least something we can do. Sort of like all those people that cook uh, and provide food because they want to do something. Nothing hurts too much. So they go. It's still dark. Dawn is coming, but the true dawn hasn't quite struck the world. And they get there. 
who knows what they talked about. If they talked at all, maybe they probably were too heartbroken to find words. Maybe they muttered small talk. They get there. And the tomb is open. And their first thought is, could it get any worse? It's gotten worse. We can't even have this. We can't even have this moment. Our beloved's been vandalized and not even given the dignity of a proper death, of a proper burial. And they go in. And all of a sudden, they're met. They're met with people. And if I asked any preschool student what the first thing an angel or a messenger of God says uh, to the people, it's always, always, almost every time, same thing Jesus often starts with, do not be afraid. But they don't say that. They do say that the women are absolutely terrified. The men almost act like they suspected that these people should know what happened. Don't you remember Jesus told you? Don't you know the stories of your tradition? Don't you know what the prophets uh, and all of Jesus' ministry was pointing towards? That nothing, nothing is more powerful than God's love. Didn't you know this was how it was going to end? And I don't think they did. I don't think any amount of telling them prepared them for what they witnessed. They walked away, and we don't know how they walked away. Did they walk away with that news still floating around here, or did they walk away with it right here? I assume probably still kind of in the abstract. What does this mean? How does this change my life? Will I ever see Jesus again? Is this just for God, because God can do whatever God wants? What does this mean for me? I wonder when the stories that we heard tonight started to ruminate those stories that were fixed in their hearts, the stories about how God made all creation, including them, the story of God's investment in them when they were in slavery and the deliverance out of that slavery, the assurance that God is always breathing new life, new hope, new opportunity into our lives. Did all those stories start to stitch them together, or was that days and days down the road? We don't know. But we know in a time and in a place where women didn't have much of a voice, these women, the first evangelists, we don't even know exactly which women they were, depending on which gospel, but these women changed the world. <coughs> So something got from here to here to here out to here. Our hearts have uh, ached this week as we watched the flames uh, engulf Notre Dame in Paris. Our hearts have ached for our brothers and sisters in Louisiana as we've seen uh, these churches burned. But we have to take a moment to think that from these women, in a thousand years, something as amazing as that cathedral was built so the people had a place worthy of God's majesty and glory. And that because of those women, commitments have been made to resurrect and rebuild there and in Louisiana, that we are here tonight because that word, that word of what happened on this day, got from those women's here to those women's here, into their actions in the world. So we boldly make our song, Alleluia. We can say it with some gusto today, and we'll say it with some gusto tomorrow, but then we'll get to work on Monday. And somebody will irritate us in some way. We'll go on our news feed and uh, we'll see that everything didn't miraculously work its way out. Uh, we'll go home and maybe we'll have a disagreement. And the alleluia will get softer and softer. 
and we'll come back here next week and uh, the lilies will start to lilt a little bit and they won't be even because some have taken their lilies home. Uh, you may see uh, some of those uh, donation envelopes still here tucked into the, uh, the, the rack from Easter, but it won't feel the same way. There won't be as many people shoulder to shoulder in the pews and the Alleluia will still be said, but it won't quite hit the ceiling the same way it does tonight and tomorrow. But that is what this is about. It's about figuring out how to get that Alleluia right to here. How to take that truth, that story that shook the world for all time, and be the kind of difference makers, the kind of radical believers in hope that those women that changed the world for all time so that in the days after this Easter, people stare in amazement at what our alleluias, what our awareness that the tomb was indeed empty, meant for the world. Alleluia, Christ is risen.